So over the summer, we have been looking at how God is all about relationship, and He is. He is. It's, it's what He made us for. It's why relationship is so important to you and I. We are to love God, and we're to love people. In fact, Jesus highlights this in the Great Commandment. I've got it here on the screens for you. Let's all out loud share it with passion together. Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. We're currently focusing on the last part of that. Love your neighbor as yourself. And we've been encouraging you to go out and smack people. Not with somebody's hand, not with your hand. No, no, of course not. SMAC is an acronym, and it stands for See the Need, Sympathize, Meet the Need, Attach Christ. Attach Christ. To smack someone is to show them God's love, to show them his kindness and compassion. And it appears that we have a superhero among us. Somebody in First Baptist Church showed up again this weekend. Uh, Let's watch. Okay, everybody, here we are at the laundromat, and uh, we're just uh, smacking people with the love and kindness of God. And, uh, you know, we're seeing the need, we're sympathizing, we're meeting the need. And, oh, my goodness. Did you guys see that? Hold on a second. I think Smackman just, just walked in. Let's see here. There he is. Let's go see if we can talk to him. Uh, Smackman. Dude, Smackman, hold on. We just want to talk to you. Smack man? Oh my goodness. Who was that mask man? The truth is, all of us can be smack man, right? I mean, we could have smack man, we have smack woman, we have smack girl, smack boy, smack kids. Yeah, all of us can. Doesn't require superhuman strength. It doesn't require a cape or a mask. It doesn't require that. Just a willingness to love people on behalf of Jesus Christ. All of us can be smack man. Just just look for somebody who's in need, somebody that could use a helping hand and help them love them, share his love. So this morning, I have two questions for you. Two questions. The first question is, if the Bible challenged you by name, what would it say? What would be that challenge? If the Bible challenged you by name, what would it say to you? The second question is this, how would the Bible describe you meeting that challenge? How would it describe you meeting the challenge it gave you? Uh, Would it say that you're obedient, that you're faithful, that, that you're committed? How would it describe you meeting the challenge? Let's grab our Bibles. Open them with me to Colossians. Colossians chapter 4, small little letter. I call these the Yun's books because they all uh, end in yuns, you know, Colossians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, 1st, 2nd Corinthians. Colossians chapter 4, verse 17, page 1,168 in the church Bibles. They're at the entrance of this room here, so feel free to grab one if you like. We see here words of challenge to a guy by the name of Archippus. Verse 17 reads, Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the work you have received in the Lord. And the Apostle Paul is writing, and he must have known Archippus. He must have known that he had potential. Uh, So he challenges him. He says, hey, see to it that you complete the work you've received from the Lord. And what a great challenge. Wouldn't it be cool to have your Bible recorded in the the Scriptures, your your name, rather, recorded in the Bible? But there's something else we need to see. Not only is this challenge given, turn to the right to Philemon. It's the short little one-page letter to right before the book of Hebrews. So go to Philemon and uh, page 1183 in the church Bibles. This is a little letter also written by Paul. And interesting, we find the second place Archippus' name is referred to. And we see it in verse 1 and 2. He writes, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. You need to understand, back in these days, those days, they didn't end their letter with their name. They began the letter so that you didn't have to go through the pages to see who wrote it. It was right up front, right as you start reading. So he's saying, Paul and Timothy to you. And, And he continues, to Philemon, our dear brother and fellow worker, to Aphia, our sister, to 
Archippus, our fellow soldiers, or Archippus, however you'd want to word it, and, and, and to the church that meets in your home. And we see his name again, only this time he's referred to as a fellow soldier. So Archippus' name is not only found twice in the scriptures, but we see the answers to the two questions that we asked, that we posed of you. If the Apostle Paul challenged you by name, would you be, would you be able to have that follow-up like Archippus? Would you be able to see that he's complimented you? Uh, you know, it, it's cool to have your name in the Bible, period. But how would the Bible challenge you? And how would you meet that challenge? How about First Baptist Church? I mean, if there was a challenge given to us in God's Word, what would it be? Is it possible that it would be something like go smack people with God's love and kindness? Hey, maybe, right? Because we know what smack means. See the need, sympathize, meet the need, attach Christ. How would you respond to that challenge? Maybe we could say, how are you responding to it? Because we're several weeks in now. Maybe it would read something like this. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, to First Baptist Church of Pekin, my fellow smack men and women, smack boys and smack girls. Hey, if, if Paul knew what this meant, it's very possible he could use that language. Because this is the call of God on our lives. This is our challenge. And wouldn't it be great to hear it said of First Baptist Church, you are fellow soldiers. In Colossians, Paul tells Archippus, complete the work you've started. Could be say, hey, keep on smacking people with God's love and kindness. Now, I know, I know, that wording, smack people, it sounds kind of silly. It does, it does. Some of you might not even like it. Think, I oh, dare the pastor use such undignified terminology in the church service. It just isn't right. But the point is to hear and to answer God's call. That's the point. God is calling us to love, to care for people, to smack people with his love and kindness. And, and are you? The word smack, it's just a clever way to remind us that we are to love others. And all, all around us, there are significant, there are eternal needs. And God wants his people to put his love on display. It's what Jesus' ministry was all about. It's what he calls us to be all about. I mean, think about this. God saw our need, didn't he? Before, before he ever sent Jesus to the world, he saw our need. He saw that people on earth were separated from him. They had rejected him. They were caught up in their sin. It was completely in the way. And the Bible is very clear about sin. It says that sin separates us from God's love, his plan for our lives. It separates us from the life he wants us to have, from, from the, the, the experience he's, he wants us to have. It separates us from the purpose he desires for us. And if we don't deal with sin, it will destroy us. It kills. It separates us from him forever. In the Bible says a place called hell. And God doesn't want that. N nobody wants that. So what does God do? You know the story. He sees our need. He sympathizes and he meets our needs literally by attaching Christ to the earth. See, God is a trinity. He's three but one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three, but somehow mysteriously one. And we don't know completely how all that works, nor do we have the time to dive into it here. But God the Father sends God the Son, Jesus, to the earth. He sees our need. He sympathizes. He sends Jesus, God the Son, to meet our need. And that's what, that's what the cross is all about. That's what it's about. Jesus, who was completely sinless, went to the cross, took on the punishment we deserve for our sin. Hey, I've told you this at least two to three dozen times. God's not good if he doesn't punish sin. 
He's not a good God unless he punishes all sin. So God the, the Son takes all of our punishment on himself. The punishment of our sin. He takes our death in a very real way at the cross. God died. All so that we wouldn't have to. Death means separation. God the Son dies. He's separated from God the Father for the first time in all existence. Why? So that we wouldn't have to be separated from Him. And then after facing the power of sin and death, He confronts and defeats sin and death. He rises three days later, proving that He's victor over the dark domain. And His message is so super clear. Repent. Turn from doing life your way. Turn from your sin to Jesus. Put your faith and trust in Him. Believe in Him. And He will save you from sin, death, and hell. And then He calls us to follow Him. To be like Him. To do life His way instead of our way. See, listen. It's all about relationship. God wants to restore us to himself. I've said it before. He's like a, a lover pursuing his lost love. God wants to restore us back to him for this eternal relationship that can begin in the here and now. And when we know, we can know his love again and know his plan and purpose again for our lives. God saw the need. He sympathized. He met the need and he attached Christ. He smacked us. God smacked us. Now, he did a whole bunch of other lesser miracles. He turned water into wine. He healed countless numbers of people. He, he calmed the storm. He raised the dead, right? He fed the multitude. Why? He saw the need. He sympathized. He met the need, and he attached Christ. Why? Why would Jesus do all this? Why would God the Father do this, saving us? Listen. People don't care what you know. They don't care. They don't care what you know until they know that you care. So when you meet needs, you're showing that you care. When you help somebody in a small or a significant way, you're showing that you care. When people realize you care, then they open up to you. They're willing to listen to you. And if there is ever a message that this world needs to hear, it's the message of Jesus, right? More than ever, maybe ever before, people do not want to listen to each other. But everything changes when you care for them. We went to the laundromat Friday and Saturday this week, and uh, it was, it's incredible, and it's consistent. You walk in. I had my T-shirt on. said First Baptist Church. I said, hey there. We're, uh, we're from First Baptist, and uh, we, my name's Vern, and, uh, and we're here, and they're looking at me like this. <laughs> and I'm smiling, and, they're, and I'm, we're from First Baptist, and, and we're paying for everybody's laundry. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. Saturday, Mark and Grassi and I, along with Dave and, and Whitney, we were at, at the laundromat. We walked in, and, and, uh, and Mark's with me. And, and we're from First Baptist, and we're paying for everything. The guy looked at me just like that. We're paying for everybody's laundry. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got to pay for everybody else's first. I said, why? He goes, because all these garbage bags are mine. And then he goes, and all of those are too. And there's about five more. And he's putting them all into these $9 quadruple load machines, you know. So take care of them first. And I smiled and I said, we're taking care of everybody's. Are you serious? I said, yeah. And it was so cool. The same thing happened Friday. Walked in. There was a lady standing there. She's actually, her back was in the video. And I, hi there. I'm first ba from First Baptist. My name's Vern. And, uh, and she's, we're paying for people's laundry. Really? Everything changes. 
What? You, when, nobody cares what you have to say. They don't care what you know until they know you care. And by paying for people's laundry, people saw that we cared. And all of a sudden, they're talking to us. We're having conversations. And, and we paid for every bit of that guy's laundry. I'm not kidding you. He must, if he thanked me once, he thanked us five times. Thank you so much. His wife came in, you know, and she's loading. She goes, you have no idea what we've been through the last couple days. This, this is, thank you so much. It's just really cool. People don't care what you know until they know you care. And when we go to the laundromat throughout the year, oftentimes once that starts warming up, that's when we're able to talk to them and, and we have this conversational style evangelism we share. And we talk, and most people don't even, I've told you this story once before. I was feeding the, 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 the uh, dryers, and this guy, he goes, I'm an atheist. I said, hey, you know, we still like to pay for your dryers. Okay, go right ahead. So I'm loading his dryers, and so I turn around to him, and I said, no strings attached. We started talking, you know, and he goes, I see what you're doing. <laughs> I was sharing the gospel with him. And I'm like, I thought you said no strings attached. And I said, no strings attached, buddy. I said, if you don't want to talk, we'll wish you a happy day. We'll continue to pay for your laundry. Everything's cool. He goes, no, no, no. And he looked at the dryer time, and there's like 23 minutes left. And he goes, the way I see it is you got about 23 minutes. <laughs> I only wanted five, you know? And he's giving me 20. We had the best conversation. It was really cool. So hey, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. It's all about relationships. God has always been about relationships. It's caring. It's loving. So God loves us, and he wants us to love others, to share his message of love with others. Jesus came because God cares. It's, it's crazy to me why people don't want to hear about Jesus. It's the greatest love story of all time. There is no greater love, no greater gift. As, and as followers of Jesus, Jesus' calls, call is now our call. His ministry is now our ministry. Je Je Jesus says in John 20, 21, he says, he says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Individually, together, each of us, each week, we're to see needs, sympathize, meet needs, and attach Christ. Why? Because God cares now, we have an enemy that wants to prevent this. You start doing this, he's going to start thwarting your plans. And the enemy wants the church to be a place and a time. Catch this. The enemy wants the church to be a place and a time, not a people. And he's done a really good job at this. We even use his vocabulary. Hey, you're going to church? I do it all the time. You're going to church Sunday? We don't go to church. We are the church. We go to church services. We go to a church building, but we don't go to church. We are the church. The enemy is happy when the church is reserved for 9 o'clock and 1030 on Sunday mornings. He wants the church kept right there, that place, that time, not, not going into the community, not living out the love and compassion of Jesus. And this is why the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1, be self-controlled, be alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. When Jesus, excuse me, when church goes from a place and a time to a people, the people of God showing and sharing his love, the enemy will fight, he will distract He'll discourage. When our community starts seeing First Baptist Church not as a building on, the, on 4th and Washington or 4th and Winter, but instead a people who care and share the love of God, the enemy will do all he can to stop us. This week, this week, you will be out and about. You will see a need. You'll begin to sympathize. And you, the messages that you've been hearing will come to your mind. And then the enemy will whisper to you, don't waste your time. This smack stuff is silly. Smack from the church? Come on. A mask? A cape? That's not Christianity. Be self-controlled. Be alert. Be sharp, ready, vigilant. Keep careful watch. He will try to sabotage, stop, deter you. 
See, we need to be ready with the very next verse, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 9, that says, Resist him standing firm in the faith. Another of Jesus' followers, James, he puts it this way. Submit yourself then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. He'll whisper to you, oh, that's madman stuff is silly. Pastor Vern's just making a mockery of church. Be self-controlled. Be alert. Submit to God. You know what his message is. Resist the devil. Be steadfast in your faith and, and represent Jesus to the world. See the need. Sympathize. Meet the need. Attach Christ. See, we don't, we're not to just go to church. We're to be the church. We are part of God's salvation plan for the world. Superheroes, what do they do on a regular day-to-day -day basis? They save the world. Guess what our job is? To go out with the only life-saving, soul-saving message and save the world. We're the superheroes here, not these fictional guys on the movie screens. We're the real deal. Demonstrate the love of God. Don't just go to church. Be the church. Show and share the message of Jesus Christ as you meet needs, sympathize with others. Demonstrate the love of kindness of God. You might be the only Jesus people ever see. Paul says it this way. In 1 Corinthians, he says, now you are the body of Christ. Next slide, please. You are the body of Christ. We're it, people. Christians on the planet, we're it. We're Jesus now to this world. Now, we're not Jesus who sits at the right hand of God. He's a very real person, and he exists, no doubt about it. But in this world, we, you, are the body of Christ. We're Jesus in this world. He's handed off his ministry to us. He's empowered us in a very real way. You are Jesus in skin. He's entrusted you with the continuation of his ministry. And it's all about relationships, loving, caring, showing, and then ultimately sharing the message of Jesus. It's incredible. It really is. You know, only two times in Scripture is Archippus's name mentioned. Colossians, where he's challenged. See to it that you complete the work that you've received in the Lord. God has given us all work to do. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, you are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. If you're a Christian, you are made for ministry. It is your destiny. Ephesians 4, the apostle Paul says this, God calls pastors, that would be me, for equipping the saints, that would be you. What for? For the work of ministry. See, a lot of people these days say, well, pastor, he's hired to do the work, you know. He, he needs to get out there and minister. He's, he's, well, that's what we hired him for. No, pastors aren't. According to Scripture, we're not supposed to do the work. We're supposed to equip the saints to do the work of ministry. Well, you know, old Betty Stevens, she didn't get her hospital visit. She's been in there three days. Hey, guess what? It's not my responsibility. It's yours. The pastors are called by God and called by the church to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Now, think about that. If that really were to happen, what would happen to the ministry levels in a local church? They would explode through the roof because no longer would it be Pastor Brad and Pastor Vern. It would be every member in the church going out and doing ministry. We would blow this place up, showing and sharing the message of Christ. Because it's not just our job, it's everybody's job, right? God has work for us to do. He has ministry for us to complete. Our Archippus, he, 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 he was told, go out, complete this work that the Lord gave you. May we be challenged like he is to go out and complete the work that the Lord has given. 
Now, some people they see his name, the Archibus. He's Archibus. He's he's only mentioned two times in all the Bible, just a little bit here and a little bit in Philemon. You know, you know what? Obviously, he must have been a nobody. Just two little places. He's a nobody. Remember the second time he's mentioned? What is he called? Fellow soldier. The Apostle Paul calls him a fellow soldier. He's a nobody. I wonder, do you ever feel like you're an, ever feel like you're a nobody? I know Christians that feel like they're just nobody Christians. And if that's you, I want to challenge you. If that's you, be the best nobody Christian you can be. Be sober. Be self-controlled. Be, be vigilant. Make, make God's work your priority in life because, because it's what really matters in life. You know, people, when they're on their deathbed, they're not, oh, I'll go get me the pictures of the house. I want my car collection. Give me a picture of the caddy. You don't hear that. Bring me my checkbook. I want to see my balance. Oh, look, at that's not that. They, they want family there. And when we remember them, we let's all gather together, remember old good old Bill Stevens. Good old Bill. Oh, Bill was incredible. He had 17 cars. He had a 16,000 square foot home and one on the East Coast as well. Here's some pictures of it. Bill was, a, he was rich. Let's talk about all the accounts he had. I have never done a funeral like that. Ever. You want the family once shared? Talk about how he helped me here. Talk about, talk about how dad was there when we need him most. Can you make sure and tell people how he cared for others? Talk about how dad was willing to sacrifice for what he believed in. That's what they want shared. It's about family. It's about relationships. It's about caring. And maybe you feel like a nobody Christian to be the best nobody Christian anybody's ever seen before. Show people what God's love is like. Be known for caring and loving and sharing. Have you ever heard this name? Mordecai Ham. Anybody ever heard of Mordecai? I got a picture of him up here for you. Anybody ever seen this guy before? Mordecai Ham. Anybody? Mordecai Ham believed in Jesus Christ. He was born in 1877. He believed and trusted his life to Christ. He even became a preacher. Anybody ever heard of the preaching ministry of Mordecai Ham? No, we haven't, have we? In fact, a lot of people look at this and say, I've never heard of this guy. He's probably a nobody Christian. Nobody Christian is what he is. Maybe, maybe. But one night, Mordecai was out preaching, and he shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. And a young man heard it and responded and committed his life to Jesus Christ. A young man who also ended up becoming a preacher. Maybe you've heard of him. Here's a picture of the young man. Billy Graham. Billy Graham's in the world, uh, the Guinness World Book of Records. He has shared the gospel with more people face to face than any person in world history. I mean, hundreds of millions of people have heard him share the gospel in person to them. Billy Graham's not with us anymore. He went home to be with the Lord, but his ministry continues because he started an organization called Samaritan Purse, International Relief. And every time something happens around the world, whether it's the Ukraine war or whether it's uh, the floods in Kentucky, guess who shows up? Samaritan Purse is there on the scene, sometimes the first people to show up, and they're there. Why? Billy Graham's gone, but Billy Graham started this ministry. His legacy continues. He has touched countless lives all over the world. Nobody's heard of Mordecai Ham. But if Mordecai Ham wasn't faithful to be preaching the truth, Billy Graham might have never heard of Jesus. And think of the loss. Maybe you feel like you're a nobody Christian. Be vigilant. Be self-controlled. Be sober. See needs. Sympathize. Meet needs. Attach Jesus Christ. Always attach Jesus. It's not hard. Hey, man, just a little way to show you that Jesus loves you. You know, when we did that at the laundromat, we did it Friday and Saturday. Just a little way to thank you so much. Hey, just a little way to show you Jesus loves you. Nobody, when they heard that, went, what? 
Hey, man, just a little way to show you Jesus loves you. Oh, you, you want to fight me? Nobody did any of that. Christian, you think, if I go talk about Jesus, if I mention his name, somebody might hit me. I have shared, I have shared Christ, the gospel, in this town easily 150, 200 times. You know what? Nobody has even raised a fist to me. Nobody. The worst case scenario is, hey, man, I'm not interested. And again, no problem. Have a great day. That's the worst. Make sure you attach Christ. You do something kind and you care for somebody, they are not going to care at all. In fact, their heart's going to resonate. Maybe you feel like a no, nobody Christian. Be vigilant. Be self-controlled. You know, see needs, sympathize, meet needs, attach Christ. Be the best nobody Christian that anybody can be. Be a Mordecai Ham. Because you never know who you're influencing. There was a boy who lived on the ocean. One morning after a big night storm, he woke up and there were thousands, tens of thousands of starfish all over the beach, washed up during the storm. And the, the boy knew that these, these starfish, rather, were going to, they're all going to die if they didn't get back in the ocean. So he started picking them up and flinging them into the ocean, you know, just as fast as he could. But there were thousands of them. Some guy down beach was walking his way, goes, hey, son! You might as well hang it up, dude. He says, there are 10,000 of these things. You forget it. You can't make a difference. The boy stopped and looked at all the starfish. He reached down and grabbed one and went, whew, plop. Made a difference to that one. <laughs> Remember the words from the Casting Crown song. Moses had stage fright. David brought a rock to a sword fight. Jesus picked 12 outsiders nobody even knew, and he changed the world. The moral of the story is everybody's got a purpose. So when you hear that devil start talking to you, you saying, who do you think you are? Just say, I'm nobody. Trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save their soul. It's all about relationship. God sent his son here for you to seek and save you. May we be like Archippus, taking the challenge to complete the work that we received from the Lord. See the need, sympathize, meet the need, and attach Christ. Because when you do, then like Archippus, you will also be a fellow soldier of Christ. Let's bow together. Lord Jesus, we are so blessed to know your love. We have been rescued from sin and death and hell. You have made us your people, carrying your name and your very spirit. We are children of the living God. And you've got a call on our life. Father, may we go today in the spirit you've equipped us with. Not a spirit of fear, but of love and of courage, and of a sound heart and mind. Father, we have your spirit in us, calling us to bring light into the darkness so that some might be saved. Maybe as you're gathered here watching online, you're realizing, this isn't mine. I have never received Christ. If you're ready to commit your life to him, do it right now. This call he's given is for you. Just pray with me. You can commit your life right now. Just say, Jesus, forgive me for my sin. I've been doing life my way. I turn from it to do life your way. I don't have it all figured out, but I believe who you are. And I believe what you did was done for me. I accept it. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. And help me to follow after you for the rest of my life. To do life your way, not mine. 
Lord, thank you that no matter who we are, no matter where we've been, no matter what we've been up to, you're ready to save us when we turn our hearts toward you. So, Father, save us and then fill us and then use us for your purposes so that others might be saved. For it's in Christ's name we pray. And everybody says, amen.